<laughs> this brings to a close the first half of today's program. Uh, just before everyone gets up, I have a quick announcement to make. Um, because there are so many people here today, and again, it's a really great pleasure to see so many people, what we're going to do to avoid crowd control issues at the door is we're going to have refreshments served in your seats. Feel free to stand up, stretch, um, do aerobics, whatever you feel like doing. Um, just, uh, and it's going to be a five-minute break. Again, that's five minutes. Please. Just go outside to the hall and just yell until I don't come in. Someone go to the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and visitors, thank you once again. We'd like to make this reconvening process as smooth and as quick as possible. So everyone, please take your seats. Everyone, please take your seats. I'm going to explain right now how the question and answer session is going to begin. We have approximately 30 minutes for this question and answer session. And rather than people standing up from the audience and addressing the speakers directly, in the interest of fairness, we have volunteers that I believe are pacing the sides of the aisles with paper and pencils for you to write down questions and submit them again to the volunteers at the side who will then bring them up to the front where, time, time permitting, we will answer as many of them as we can. Please accept our apologies in advance if we don't get to every question. 30 minutes is not a long amount of time. Each question will also have, each question will also have a time limit for the speakers, which will be announced before the question is read. Two minutes? One minute for the rebuttal? Okay. The first question that we have is for Dan Barker. And this is a two-minute response plus a one-minute rebuttal from Hassanein. The question is as follows. You have stated that you're a moral person. What is the foundation for your morality? Where do you derive your morals from? And what evidence can you provide to prove that your moral system is good slash correct? Two minutes, please. By definition, morality means the lessening of harm. If people increase harm, by definition, they are immoral. If, it's, if they unnecessarily increase harm in the world, they are immoral people. We can use the word evil as a kind of a tag for that. Morality, by definition, then, is the minimizing of harm. That's what we all mean. If you do things that make harm less, then you are a moral person. And as a corollary, we can also say enhancing life is also nice, a compassion and adding to understanding. So if morality is basically the minimizing of harm, none of us want to hurt, do we? We all want to have, raise our families. We all want to be free of pain and of coercion. Then the question becomes not where do we get these absolute principles. The question becomes how do we identify harm? What is harm? Harm is a natural thing. Harm and its identification and its avoidance are natural exercises. If this were a cup full of arsenic and I handed it to Hassan, then that would be a, a harmful act. But if it's a glass of water and I hand it to him, well, then that would be a good act if he's thirsty. I assume he's thirsty. So harm is, is relative to our human natures and the environment we live in, and its avoidance is a natural exercise. And most of us uh, have good enough minds, unless you're, unless you're unhealthy in some way, we have good enough minds to know how to, to do that. It's, and a lot of it is just common sense. Of course, most moral dilemmas involve a conflict of values. It's not always just should I do this or shouldn't I, but should I do this or should I do this? I have two or more courses of action, in which case it becomes an exercise of assessing the relative merits of the various consequences of those acts and trying seconds. to decide which one of those uh, leads to the less amount of harm. And it, even if you fail, if you intend to lessen harm in the world, you can be called a moral person. The problem with absolutist Five morality seconds. is that... Uh, you, you will do what is right or wrong because of some absolute mandate. Time is up, Because you Parker. evaluated the consequences. One minute reply. Well, first of all, I have a difficult understanding with your uh, definition of morality. It seems to be very self-centered morality where the individual, I am good, therefore the world is good. 
I like good things, therefore the world likes good things. And this ideology of morality that's self-centered can never be a social ideology that can never be legislated in the, in the sphere of uh, social beings. You, for example, in your website say, there is no universal moral urge, you say, and not all ethical systems agree. Polygamy, for example, human sacrifice, cannibalism, wife beating, all these are perfectly moral actions in certain cultures. Is God confused? Your implication, therefore, is polygamy is wrong. Okay? So it's got nothing to do with harm. If a woman wants to, if uh, uh, three women get married to one man, to you, that's, not, uh, that's harm. I don't understand how you came up with that conclusion. But when you say, for example... Uh, Ten seconds. Uh, yeah. To call God non uh, is, is contradictory. We, uh, there is no higher moral good that comes from this ideology. And it can never be legislated there. Time out. Our next question is to Hassanin Rajabali. And this is a two-minute response and again a one-minute rebuttal. <clears throat> Why is it necessary to believe in God? Won't God treat all equally good men equally, regardless of race, sex, or creed? God creates everything with perfect uh, creation. It's a perfect creation. Everybody's been endowed with their abilities. You find insects are able to protect their own environments and able to live. Animals have their own environments by which to live. If you observe all the discovery channels today where all these uh, interesting videos that are being displayed today shows this grand scheme of things where this creator has endowed every creature with the ability to sustain its life and therefore is able to procreate and able to sustain in this incredible universe. So the existence of God is a necessity because as I say, I and everything in this universe is a transient existence. It cannot demand its own existence, therefore it requires what we call a necessary existent, and that is the one that has brought into our existence. So do we need God? Yes. Not only for our own existence, but our moral codes are derived from that too. There is a higher, longer uh, uh, focus for a human being. There's ethical standards that that which I do today is accountable in the hereafter. But as for non a non-believer, an atheist says, I can do whatever. In other words, do, uh, committing a perfect crime is a good deed. As long as you don't get caught, it's fine. I think that missed the point of the question. If, if I am a good and moral person by your standards, if you judge me to be a good moral person, but I don't believe in a God, uh, is it right then for your God to punish me for the simple fact of unbelief in him, if I am a good and moral person? That was the question that was being asked. Why is it necessary to believe if we can live good lives, and you have to admit that many Atheists and agnostics live good lives, and many theists live horrible lives, right? Many people who believe in God live horrible lives. So the question really is, why should I be punished in an eternal hell for simply living a good moral life as you live? That is unfair. Any God who has that type of a system is, is not a good God. It's not worthy of my worship. The next question is to Hassanein Rajabali, and this is a two-minute response and a one-minute rebuttal again. Why do Muslims need to follow a book of religion if there is a God? Wouldn't there be some real signs and absolute directions to man and God outwardly accepting responsibility for his actions? God creates a system where he gives man free will. And that free will allows him to decipher wrong from right. The differences that we have in opinion is a prime reason to show that there is free will. For if everybody was thinking the same way and there would be no ambiguity in any, in, in any issue, then the implication would be that it's a defeated purpose for the exam itself is not under its truest form of exam. And you know, in any exam, the greater the difficulty of the exam, the greater the value of the exam. For if that student passes, that, that student deserves a greater reward. So when you say that there's a moral God, when we talk about this, this, uh, uh, this God that we, that we follow, he gives us the laws. Divine laws are essential, what we call our guiding light. An individual who says, I'm good, like Dan says, I'm a good person, there's nothing wrong with me, why would God punish me? If a student goes into class and refuses to observe the rules of the exam, and says, but I'm a good student, okay, will the teacher say, since you're so good, but since you're rejecting the way of the exam, it's okay, I'll pass you? I don't understand that. My response is that I am, only, I am being condemned to an eternity in hell for the simple fact that I do not believe, not for something that I've done. Atheists and agnostics and humanists say that people should be judged by their actions, not by their beliefs. Beliefs don't make you a good person. There are many devout believers who commit horrible actions. 
So uh, it, is, it is wrong again to say that just because I don't believe is that somehow breaking a rule. What sense is there in having a rule that says believe when you can, you can still take the exam without believing that there's some great exam maker in the sky? You can still get the questions right, can't you? You can still live a good life without the belief. I live a good life without the belief in your God. And yet your God wants to punish me forever for the simple act of not believing in his existence. That's unfair. The next question is to Mr. Barker. And again, it's a two-minute response and a one-minute rebuttal. Science cannot and will not ever explain everything. Thus, there will always be a God of the gaps. Don't you agree? Well, um, yeah, except science is closing a lot of doors. There were some questions that, we, that were open. For example, Darwin did not understand genetics. He did not understand the DNA. And if Darwin had, he would have closed a gap in his mind. He was confused. And yet we have closed some of those gaps. And science is progressing. And who was Isaac Newton to say that we would never understand the formation of planetary systems? And who was Hassanein to say that we have now reached the end of knowledge? All of these gaps uh, will never be closed again. Uh, I'll ask you the same question I asked you before. What happens when those gaps are closed? What happens when we do have a perfectly natural cosmological explanation for the origin of the universe? Then will you reject your belief in God? What happens when we do have a perfectly natural understanding of design uh, apart from the question of whether it's relative or absolute? Then when that gap is closed, will you reject your belief in a God? Is it really an honest argument you're making or are you coming to the argument with your belief in God first looking for gaps to plug? So sure, science doesn't know. I mean, there, there's a million things we don't know. That's what drives science. If we didn't have that uncertainty, then science would not be driven. And, Atheists and agnostics welcome the uncertainty. We like not knowing. We don't have to invent some answer. We like having debate and argument and disagreement because that's what drives the pursuit of truth. What you're saying, first of all, with regards to uh, science, you have taken the assumption that science answers everything. How does science answer the power of reason? How does science answer the power of love, the power of hate? Uh, ethical questions, morality. Where in science, within the, fi within the five senses and empirical observation, can you tell me that science has ever delved into the question of moral ethics? You can't. Science is limited. The reason I'm saying that you can never get the answer is if you've limited yourself within the certain set of tools which are in itself limited, and then you're saying that only this tool is going to give me the answer when in itself it's limited, then I can say with, without any hesitation that you will never get the answer. Because First and foremost, science is limited within its scope. That's why you find scientists do not talk about the existence of God because within the empirical observations, you're not allowed to. Even Stephen Hawking says that. He says this is Ten something seconds. for the philosophers to talk about. We scientists are just simply empirical observers. What you make out of it is your issue. The next question is for Hassanin Rajabali. If humans need a reference to go forward, then shouldn't God come within that reference for us to understand him? God is the absolute creator. He has no frame of reference. Thus, to put him in a frame of reference implies that he is limited, and God is not limited, and therefore he's not within that scope of reference. For you and I, as, as, as our prophet says, Man arafa nafsa faqad arafa rabba. If you know yourself, you will know your Lord. And that power of self-introspection and knowing who you are in an indirect fashion is sufficient evidence. Even Dan himself says that an indirect fashion of reasonable thinking, where you use logical explanations in an indirect fashion, you can ascertain things. For example, someone says, I love you. Well, can you define it? Can you display it to me? Is it quantified? Can you ever observe it? Never. It comes in an indirect fashion when someone sacrifices themselves under difficult conditions. He said, aha, that person loves me. No one has rejected the existence of love, but it's not a directly observable entity, the same as the power of reason, and there are many, many entities as such that are not directly observ observable, and sufficient evidence is to say that the relative entity cannot exist by itself without the absolute. The absolute has no frame of reference, thus to de defy, defy the system and to say that God therefore should be relative, Okay, is begging the question. Because when you say that, you say, why doesn't God come in the human form? Okay, when he, let us say, it's a, it's a ridiculous question, but let us say for argument's sake, yes. If he came, what would be the requirements of this human 
quote unquote God that you will approve of. You'll say, oh, he has two eyes. No, I wish he had three eyes. If he had three eyes, I'd worship him. Okay, he has three eyes, you know, he has four eyes. If he has no eyes, he has no eyes. So you now you see, what you want to do is essentially you want to bring him down to the relative world so that you can deny him. And that's the problem, that God is not a relative entity. The fact that he's absolute overwhelms the human mind and that is sufficient for one to submit. <clears throat> One minute, Mr. Pope. I disagree. Love can be observed. It can be studied. It can be measured. Love is a verb. It's an action. If I am abusing my wife, there's an indication that I don't love her. If I am burning my children with fire, there is an indication that I do not love them. The fact that I provide their needs, that I meet them, that I spend time with them. Love is something that we do observe and measure. Many scientists are, uh, are addressing the moral questions. You're wrong to say that science doesn't address moral questions. I'm, right now I'm reading Matt Ridley's book, The Origin of Virtue. I just read Steven Pinker's book, The Blank Slate, addressing the human nature uh, instinct to compassion and to uh, reciprocal altruism and the evolutionary genetic advantages to those things within our species. Science does address those things and does come up with good answers for what you think are mysterious questions. The next question is to Mr. Barker. Just a reminder, both of you have, when, when you address the question, you have two minutes to respond. And oh, well, one we, minute. but no, we don't have to take the phone. No, you don't have to take it, okay. just so that you're aware. The question reads as follows. If an atheist can live by a moral code, then how do you explain the killing of millions of human beings by the greatest atheist of all time, Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, Hitler, etc.? Well, most atheists do not say they live by a moral code. A code is something that's codified. It's a list. Like you have a list of Ten Commandments of do this or don't do that. Few atheists would say they live by a moral code. Most of us say we live by moral principles. And as I elaborated earlier, the principle of minimizing harm in the natural world is a principle that works for us. It, that's what morality means. Yes, uh, atheists have done horrible things. No one denies that. Uh, atheism is not a creed. It's not a religion. Uh, just as uh, many Christians are shocked at how uh, some of their uh, co-believers have murdered abortion doctors, you know, and say that doesn't represent all Christians. Uh, but think about Stalin, for example, who was seminary trained, or think about Hitler, who was a Christian, a member of the Catholic Church. Think about some of these people. Were they doing it in the name of atheism to promote atheism, or were they doing it for political reasons? Were they, were they brutal tyrants for political, personal gain? Of course, a atheism is not pretend to make you a better person. Atheism never says that. Atheism is simply the absence of a religion. But some of us atheists feel that the absence of religion is still superior to the presence of an absolutistic moral code in which if a god says kill, you should kill, and it's right because God says it's right, that's immoral. So um, uh, I'm not going to try to excuse a uh, Stalin or Pol Pot or them. I'm going to denounce them as well. Atheists or not, I'm going to de denounce those actions as immoral because they cause unnecessary harm. Well, first of all, the question is that when you, you cannot legislate what you just said. You said that the moral code, we don't have a moral code. So how did, you, how did you condemn it? You condemned it on an individual level, not on a social level. You can never legislate this condemnation because what Stalin and what Marx did has no correlation to your any, any basic because you don't have any moral codes. So how can you legislate that? How can you vociferously say, Dan Barker may say yes. Another atheist may say no. What, what Stalin did was very good. This is what the anarchistic mentality that a appears as a result of a person who says there is, there is no moral code. You make it as you go. You're a free thinker. No one tells you what to do. Do what you want, how you want, when you want. No one's your boss. You're your own boss. Essentially then, the sadomasochist who likes to inflict pain and the, and the masochist who likes to receive, pa receive pain, if they became our global leaders, it would be perfectly justified. What Ten Hitler seconds. did was perfectly fine. As a result, when you say that uh, the more there is no moral code. This in itself is the danger in itself. The next question is to Hassanin Rajivali. Just so in the audience that you know, when there are five seconds left, I'm counting down on my hands. I'm not making some strange hand signal to you. <laughs> the question reads, I, as a relatively ignorant bourgeois, believe that I cannot know if God is a reality. Furthermore, by the ethos of my background, to take a stand one way or another would be an act of arrogance. Are you willing to consider the possibility that you cannot know, even if you consider it for a short time? 
A person who is not endowed with enough understanding comes into that position that he cannot know. And that's a perfectly reasonable argument. And in that state, you have every right to say that I don't know. And to, to limit yourself in the state of suspension when you say, I'm not certain. But that does not preclude the fact that you should not therefore search for it because the evidence is sufficient, plenty of evidence. It's equivalent to saying that we don't know about this theory or we don't know about this existence. That does not say therefore that in the world of science you should not go out and delve into the depths of, uh, of the universe and find it. And that finding of the self is so inherently important in this whole entire discussion. We're not talking about matter out in space. We're not talking about planetary bodies out in space. We're talking about ourselves, our ethical issues. Even Dan agrees with me that we are moral creatures. We condemn. We believe. When you say, I don't believe, we atheists are non-believers. No, you are believers. You are believers in a system. And a system accepts certain things and rejects certain things. To monopolize a word and say, I'm not a believer, in a system of ways. Eric Fromm, who's a, who's a uh, uh, philosopher, German philosopher, said, the question is not whether you are religious or not. I mean, the question is not whether you have a religion or not. The question is, which religion do you have? Rejecting God is a religion. It's a way of life. It, it has its effects on all human beings. That if that person who is an atheist becomes the president, becomes a legislator, he's going to in, in, instill his, his ideologies upon the people. You cannot be a, tra a creature in limbo, floating in space with no ideology. And to take that position every once in a while and say, well, look, I'm not harmful. I'm not doing anything. Well, here, Pol Pot, as we mentioned, uh, Mao Zedong, Karl Marx, millions of people were killed because of that. Millions. Can we say that therefore they were wrong? By whose standards? By their standards? They said, who can tell me I'm wrong? I don't have any moral codes. I can do what I want. I got away with it, and it's perfectly fine. So um, we're going to give Mr. Barf a chance to. To say that atheists are unbelievers in God is not to say that atheists have no beliefs in other things Atheists can be uh, fiercely committed and have a belief in the equal treatment of women, for example, and denounce the uh, mistreatment of women in most of the revealed religions. We can have a belief that it's better for humanity if women and men were, cr were created equal. It doesn't follow that if we don't believe in God, we don't have any beliefs. I never said that, so there's another straw man. You also did another ad hominem, Hassanain. You said, to those of us who are not endowed with understanding, which basically is an attack on me. Somehow, you have more understanding. What do you know that I don't? Is there some secret thing that you know about the world that I don't? You're endowed with understanding, but I'm not. You're the chosen one, and I'm not. You're special, you're blessed, and I'm not. Ten you seconds. have vision, and I am blind. Is that what you're saying? And only those who are blessed with superior vision and intelligence, which is re really kind of a self-centered thing to say. But uh, uh, um, ad hominem, Time is up, Mr. Park. Ad hominem uh, attacks are not acceptable within a debate. Thank you. The next question is to you, Mr. Barker. And it reads, if God does not exist, then how do you account for that inner voice that each of us possesses scientifically? How can you explain this? Isn't this beyond our relative realm? Well, an inner voice could mean a million different things. Uh, sometimes when I am stressed from two or three nights of staying up late, sometimes I might hear my mother's voice in my mind. Carl Sagan he said he used to hear an inner voice of his parents talking. It's a natural thing that happens when the brain sometimes goes into certain states. Uh, I know a man who says he talks to Jesus all the time, and Jesus' voice is very clear to him. And he says he's a baritone. He knows that Jesus is a baritone because he hears his voice. So uh, people who hear voices I don't think are good arbiters of truth. Uh, we do have, I don't have an inner voice for morality. I simply have a principle that says Stalin was wrong, not because he broke some code, not because he didn't follow some list of do's and don'ts. Stalin was wrong because he caused harm. That's simple to understand, isn't it? He caused harm. Hitler caused harm. We know what harm is. He didn't have to, and he did. So I can say, based on the relativistic definition of what morality means, we are human beings who want to survive. We recoil from pain by nature. You stick your hand in a fire, you pull from it, right? You don't need some code to tell you, thou shalt pull thy hand from the flames. It's our nature to recoil from pain. So if we're going to use the word morality at all, we're talking about natural harm in the natural world. And I can denounce Stalin uh, on that relativistic principle that he could have and did not minimize harm in his world. Therefore, he was what we could call with a lowercase e, an evil person. Thank you. When, you say, One minute. when you say cause harm, if a man goes to battle and he's fighting and he gives his life for the cause 
of the greater. He caused harm to himself by his own death, yet we call them heroes. So it's very relativistic when you say cause harm. When you say cause harm, when you're killing something for the greater good, how would, then would you define what is the greater good? You say, no, we don't cause any harm. So if battle takes place between two people, there is harm. Therefore, what do you do then? Do you just simply uh, prevent harm? How would you prevent harm without, without causing harm to the other side? So when you say we don't cause harm, that's a very loose term. It's very, very, uh, uh, as we say, vague. It, it's not applicable. It's not practical. I'm not rejecting that we should stop harm. I'm not rejecting that. But the question is, you cannot apply it on a legislative fashion. You cannot apply it in a social arena. Ten it's seconds. very individualistic, and I think that's where the problem lies. Thank you. The next question is again addressed to Hassanin Rajabali. And it reads, if an atheist offered a reasonable explanation for why the universe exists and for all evidence of design, and for all evidence of design, would you concede that there might be no God after all? You're asking a question which is really an impossibility by its own nature. If you say that there is a reasonable, uh, reasonable uh, answer for no creator, okay, the reasonable answer, first of all, you have to jump over the basic hurdle of asking yourself, how does a relative universe come into existence by itself? Whatever that answer you're going to give me has to be God, whether you want to call it God, whatever the case may be, that supreme power is what we're discussing. How you name it is based on your own perceptions. But the question is that infinite power is a necessity. Anything less than that, it's been created for centuries, anything less than that is not sufficient. So you're saying that theoretically you would allow for the possibility of an impersonal, transcendent, supernatural force that's not personal you would allow for the possibility that the universe came into existence by some s supernatural means that's not necessarily a, a being that we can worship. You allow for that theoretical possibility then. No. You, see, you just seem to say that. No, I did not. Well, it, then, if you are saying it is impossible for a non-personal being to have caused the universe, then I say you're begging the question. I am open. If you can give me evidence for, the, for a God, I will change my mind. If you can give me evidence for Allah, I will change my mind and will believe in Allah. I will do that. But you have a closed-minded position. You, you have boxed yourself into a corner saying, there is, you said it is an impossibility. Those were your words. Therefore, you're not open to truth. You're, you're being dogmatic in your position. Convince me and I'll change Ten my seconds. mind. I've done it before and I'll do it again. And I would like to hear you say the same thing, that you would change your mind if the evidence warranted. I wish we had the cross-examination. We've been... We'll, we'll discuss this. <laughs> sure. Uh, for those of you who still have questions or who would like to now start asking follow-up questions, or some questions that have been asked, please bring them up to the front. Uh, Samir is right here. You can all see him. Um, that would make the process much easier. Let's see. The next question w is to Mr. Barker. And it reads... You say that science does not know everything, yet you also say that atheists go by the code of inflicting the least harm. But if you yourself do not know everything, you are not in a correct position to decide what inflicts the least harm. What do you say to that? Well, I said it before. Uh, by definition, morality is the intention to minimize harm. That's what it means. We're not even discussing morality unless we have a definition. So by definition, what do you mean by morality? You can't mean just following orders. You can't take the Nuremberg defense and say, I was just doing what my boss has told me. We have to use our minds. So I said before that most moral dilemmas come when you have a conflict of values, not when you're just trying to decide yes or no on this, but when there's a conflict of values. If your intention is to assess the merits, the relative merits of the consequences of these different actions, and thereby to compute what would be the least amount of harm through those two actions. If that is your intention, even if you fail because we don't know everything, then you can be called a moral person. You might, I, you know, I might commit an act that I think is moral, and, I, and due to my ignorance, I cause more harm. Well, uh, you know, the law looks at intention, right? The law looks at what you intend to do, and uh, I, I will feel horrible if I made the wrong mistake. I would, and I would hope to learn from it. That's what moral education is. We learn from our mistakes. But if my intention was to minimize harm, whatever that means, whatever my level of education and experience and knowledge is of the facts, then I can be called a moral person. If my intention is to increase harm, if that's my intention, to increase unnecessary harm, 
uh, then I would be called an immoral person. I would be called uh, um, even evil. I don't, I don't like these absolute words, good and evil with capital letters, but we can use them as language tags for the intention of a person to, to create harm in the world where it is not necessary to be created. There are, I agree with you, there are no clear answers either way, but we can legislate morality if enough of us get together, if enough human beings get together and say, we don't like what Hitler did, then we can make laws to try to stop Hitler. There's no big mystery to that. And if enough of us get together on some of these issues that are, aren't such a gray area, let's Sorry, say. Sorry, 10 seconds. Then we can make a legislation, and legislation is fluid. In our country, laws change and they improve over time. But in religious morality, laws have no room for improvement. You say that I'm close-minded. Yes, if you're going to say that I'm rational, I'm using logic, I'm using evidence, I'm using uh, observations, then yes, you might say that I'm close-minded. To answer your question, you mentioned the law. If you say something and it's wrong, well, the law will recognize it was my mistake. You have not defined this law. It's arbitrary. You notice it comes into existence in your mind, then it disappears. It's almost like you're creating it to justify something, then it disappears again. If you say enough people come together and you can justify, so if Germany did what it did, the majority of the Germans believed in the cleaning of the ethnic race, uh, you know, removal of the, the non-ethnic race, then from your moral standards, what Hitler did and his people and what Saddam is doing today in Iraq is, sufficiently, is sufficient evidence to say that they are morally right. And that just begs the question. Thank you. The next question is for Hassanein. Could you please elaborate on the Islamic perspective of evil and hell as a natural consequence of one's own action and not of God's making? Hell is something you and I earn due to our own rejections. And Dan before took umbrage when I said that, you know, when you have lack of understanding, it was never implied that you don't take any personal things. As I mentioned to you, there's nothing to take personal here. It's not implying that you're ignorant in any way. We're having a discussion in this matter. And I did not say that. The question was that if I have a lack of understanding, can I suspend? I never said it is you as lack of understanding, and therefore you've, in fact, you haven't suspended. You've taken a position. To answer this question with regards to uh, the position of evil from the Quranic perspective and from the Islamic perspective, mankind has been endowed with enough evidence and enough gifts for him to reject that system is tantamount to be punished. Just like a teacher who punishes you after having taught you and you failed the exam. That punishment is a natural consequence. No one says, this student failed. Well, you're being unfair. You should pass him. Well, then you're degrading the entire system. For someone to go to hell, understand that there are dimensions. And it's, it's not our uh, uh, platform to discuss it, but I would love to have that discussion on that. But the issue of hell is something that human beings earn. The Quranic perspective is those who go to hell will say it is our own misdeeds. Had we listened, had we obeyed, had we ob accepted what was given to us so prevalent, we would not be the inmates of this punishment. And that punishment is meted out on the basis of the great mercy of God given unto man to live in perpetuity in par paradise. And if someone was to say that this is this carrot that is being called or this golden pot, look, every human being functions in that system. We're goal-oriented. We go to work because we want to get paid at the end of the week. Should we deny that? You're saying deny that. Have no acceptance of any pot at the end of the day. That's preposterous. We are living in this system. If God has created this system and we are within it, it doesn't mean we created heaven and hell in order to provide ourselves the moral codes. Even as a father, you say to your, your child, don't do this, this will happen. Why do you restrict your child from doing that? Because you know there's an impending danger in that. If God is giving us these standards Ten for seconds. us to follow, there's nothing wrong with it. It's perfectly fine. Does it ever occur to you, Hassanain, that if there is a heaven and a hell, and if heaven is getting to live for eternity with the God of the Bible or the God of the Koran, and if some of us have examined the actions and the intentions of that God, we find it to be beneath our dignity as moral people, does it ever occur to you that some of us might prefer hell to living in a heaven with your brutal dictator who creates such harm? Some of us might think that was a moral thing to do. I wouldn't mind spending an eternity in hell if, if, if it was a better moral act. Let him prove what a macho man he is and send me to hell to torture me forever simply for the crime of not believing, in his, for the crime of questioning his motives. So I take my denunciation in hell as a form of a compliment, and I thank you for the compliment. All the good people will be in hell, Mark Ten Twain seconds. and Bertrand Russell and, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We're going to have some great conversations while you're up there bowing down before your... Master Lord. I mean, really, think about Time. the choice. I have more dignity Time is up, than that. Lord.
Um, this question is for Um, just a point of order. We'll be finishing up in approximately five minutes or so. We'll have time for, I, I think, one question on each side. No closing statements? Uh, yeah, and then no closing, closing statements. Okay. Overseas? Okay. The question is for Mr. Barker. Many a time we make a meticulous plan, but yet it fails in the last stage. Who overrules your plan? Many times we make a meticulous plan and it falls apart. That happens a lot of times. This debate was one example. We had a few minor glitches. Um, most of us unbelievers are somewhat pragmatic about the world. We know that things aren't going to happen exactly the way we plan them. We're not gods. We don't pretend to have perfection. So we, uh, you know, we don't pretend to be omniscient. We don't pretend to be all-powerful. We accept our human limitations in the natural environment in which we live. And sometimes things will not go according to our plan because we're not all powerful. And I don't care. I mean, as long as I'm intending to do the best I can, if I fail somehow, if the plans go wrong, then I will learn from that mistake. So um, I, I hope I will learn from that if I'm open-minded. If I learn, that's what happened with Christianity. I preached it for 19 years. And I studied it more closely and I learned, oops, I made a mistake. This is the wrong religion. This isn't for me. And um, Ibn Warak did the same thing with Islam. He lived the Islamic life, the Muslim life, and yet he studied it closely with an eye of scholarship and gives excellent reasons for why he changed his mind. Things didn't go exactly as he planned. He thought I was going to be a faithful Muslim his whole life. And he started studying the evidences, started looking at the criticisms. He realized there's something better than this. One minute. It's interesting you say that a person like Ibn Warak takes that position, you know, just because a human being, you know, lacks understanding and takes a position that does not imply anything in any way. Uh, when you take, for example, the position that you've taken with regards to uh, the moral codes, but once again, you have not justified a social system. When you say you're promoting this anarchistic ideology that every human being is a free thinker on his own, and as long as 51 people out of 100 sufficiently decide on something, as we call a democracy, it becomes moral. See, that's taking democracy to a higher level where we say it's moral now. And that really is, uh, is deadly in, in its very system. And to say that a person says, well, I have that free thought and things don't go right the way they do, that doesn't mean you abandon. From what I read, Dan, from all your perceptions, and the statement you just Ten made seconds. is this terrible God. You seem to have a lot of anger. And, I, and if that's anger, then I think you should vent it out differently. <laughs> this is... This... This is going to be the final question. It's a two-minute answer from Hassanein and a one-minute rebuttal. Following that, we'll ask the speakers to have their closing arguments for, try to keep it under five minutes if possible, okay. uh, for their closing arguments. This final question reads, if there were a God, why would it put people on the earth to waste time? Sorry. If there were a God, why would it put people on the earth to waste their time praying? Waste their time. There is an assumption there that what we're doing is useless, and that in itself is a negating question. A person who prays is praying for his own good. Science has even shown, even those who don't believe in God, that those intercessory prayers and those people who pray on their own, if you study, there is research done that people who are in, in, uh, in the hospital bed themselves, not others praying for them, themselves, okay, have a higher rate of, uh, of, of cure than those who don't. And that means prayer is shown to be a very good entity. When someone prays, it is for themselves. It takes them to greater moral grounds. When a person submits himself and gives himself into charity, into goodness, and, and controls his animalistic behavior and becomes a chaste and a good person, I don't see how you can say that's a waste of time. Prayer is good for the individual. God does not need prayer. Prayer is a means by which to reap the wonderful uh, mercies of God and to negate that is tantamount to disconnecting the jugular vein of the individual. Today, in modern world today, children are not 
uh, uh, taught about God in schools and look what they're doing. The spiritual, sp- humans are made of material and spiritual. You deny the spiritual aspect, they're going to go and fill it up. Today there's, there's a, an, a problem in the United States with devil worship, all types of ridiculous behavior in trying to reach the realm of the unseen. It's a human nature to deny it is to choke it. Therefore prayer is very good and for one to say it's, it's, a, it's a baseless act, yeah, it's, that, that's, that's totally ignorant in a statement. Mr. Barker, you have one minute to respond. I mean, my point. I'm, I'm sorry. The for time a person is to up, pray, what's name? wrong with it? Mr. Barker, you can have a minute and five seconds. You need to look a little more closely at these evidences. Dr. Richard Sloan and others have done a careful study of these so-called intercessory prayer studies, and shown that they are all flawed. Everyone agrees that relaxing during recuperation can help somebody's recovery. No one agrees that praying will re- restore a lost eyeball or a lost arm or will get rid of cancer. No, that never happens. But if you are recovering and you need lower blood pressure in order to recover, then prayer in connection with your faith in your community, be it religious or non-religious, like what happened with my wife when she almost died in the hospital. She found support from her community of non-believing family and friends, and that helped her to recover better. And so prayer as a, as a way to try to cajole some, some praise glutton of a God to change the laws of nature to my benefit, uh, that never has been shown to work. Nothing fails like prayer. We all know that prayer is a failure, except it can make you feel better and maybe Ten recover seconds. a little faster in some types of, of medical recuperations. <laughs> so you do agree. This, this brings to an end. This, this brings to an end the question and answer session of our program. At this point, uh, both speakers will have an opportunity to present their closing arguments. I'm asking that you keep it under five minutes. Um, both of you and Mr. Barker, you began, so we'll give you the chance to conclude first. Thank you for sitting through this long event. Great will be your reward on earth uh, for that. Uh, (laughs) As I said in my opening statement, Hassanein, you and I have a lot in common. You and I have virtually identical DNA. My blood could be used as a transfusion to save your life and vice versa. My children could breed with your children. Somewhere back in time, you and I have a common ancestor, somewhere back. Each of us has been physically cut from our mothers. We know that. We are basically one huge physical organism. You and I truly are brothers in the same species. My dad is a Delaware Indian, uh, the Lenape Indian. In fact, uh, my ancestral homeland is right across the Hudson River here in what is now New Jersey. Before we were forced to leave our homeland because of the Christian European invaders who came over here with a weapon in one hand and a Bible in the other, claiming that it was God's will to chase us off, similar to what the Christian European crusaders did to the, to the Arabs, which I think was morally wrong. They had no moral right to go over there to try to replace one religion with another. And similar, in my own personal opinion, not all, not all atheists agree, but similar to the way the Christian, the uh, European Jewish settlers came into that area and tried to claim some religious claim to the land. I think we should stop building these walls. I think we should stop drawing these circles. You have a circle that you're in. You're a respected man and a knowledgeable man in a certain circle in the world. But outside of that circle are the infidels, the unbelievers. There's we versus they, us versus them. And those out there are the ones that are our enemies. My mom was also uh, uh, part Apache Indian, although she had a grandmother whose last name was Sulphur, which is some kind of a Semitic name or Jewish name. So maybe we have a common ancestor that's closer than we, th- than we think. Who knows? Uh, her, her parents came from Spain. So it may be that maybe 10 generations ago, you and I had the same you know, ancestral father and mother. That makes us one. The Bible and the Koran apparently are your source of information about this God that you worship. It didn't just come out of the air. You get your information. Those books, if you read them, and I've, I've really enjoyed reading some of the Koran as I've been able to. I'm no expert in it. But they really are, at the bottom, books of war. 
They are books about us versus them and fighting. The God of those books is the God of war. And I think if there's to be any hope for our world, we don't all have to convert to atheists. It is not my mission to try to convert you to an atheist. I think there's little chance of that happening, right? <laughs> I don't care what you believe. I don't care if you want to believe in all or if you want to stand on your head and speak in tongues and pray to Mother Goose. I don't care. This is a free world. In America, we have a separation of religion and government where the government backs off and says, you're free to believe what you like even if everyone thinks it's stupid or not. Even if you think atheists are stupid and evil. They're free to be atheists in this country, right? We need a, a system in this world where we stop equating religion with government. I don't see what is to be gained in my life by believing in a God. I don't see what I get out of it. I don't see what, you know, maybe God is so hungry to be praised. <coughs> I mean, would you worship me if I stood up and said, you should pray to me every day? Mm -hmm. No, you wouldn't do that, right? You would think I was some kind of a megalomaniacal sick guy who was, wanted to be worshipped and praised all the time with little servants down there who bow down and say, yes, you are great. Uh, y you know, uh, if there's this deity up there, what do I gain from believing in it? Uh, as I told you, hell doesn't scare me. The threats of punishment don't scare me. I want to live my own life. I want to live it with good natural principles. Uh, I hear it said that religion is a way to offer you to live a good life. Well, here's what we atheists say. If you want to get, live a good life and be kind to others, then live a good life and be kind to others. If I'm motivated to be kind to others by the threat of hell, then that shows how little I think of myself, doesn't it? I need some help to be a good person. I am no good. Or if I'm persuaded to be kind to others by the promise of heaven, well, that shows how little I actually think of others. I'm doing it for selfish reasons. I want to go to heaven. I want to be coddled by this daddy up there who's going to make me feel good and give me things. Most atheists and humanists in the world say, let's be good for goodness sake. And to conclude, we have... And Rajabali speaking for five minutes. Before he comes to the podium, I'd just like to ask everyone, I heard some whispers going around in the audience. Um, these are the closing arguments. Please have respect for the speakers. Um, they came here to speak, so please, many of you came here to listen. Thank you, Dan, for your, for your closing arguments. I will just make some very quick points here. Uh, First and foremost, what we get in conclusion to this debate is that we see that those who hold this free-thinking mentality, this free-thinking concept of life, are lawless people who essentially, when we say lawless, let me explain. I'm not, I don't want to take it out of, uh, out of uh, perspective. They're not socially bound in any law system. As Dan has mentioned, that um, uh, stop building these walls. Let's break them down. What you're saying is, take all the laws out, take all institutions down, dismantle them because they do nothing but harm. Well, if you dismantle them, are you going to live in a lawless society? Is that what you're promoting? Or are you going to say, dismantle it and rebuild it? Okay, when you rebuild it, you just built a wall again. So which one is, has the higher goal? When you talk about universality of our existence, you say we are the same. Yes, we are the same. And that's the ingenuity of our existence. That if a person is asked to program something where it can take every parameter into possibility, into action, that a person's mind and thought decides to do something with this application, you ask that, you ask that programmer what a harrowing task that is. It's an, it's an impossibility to put all actions together where a person has this completely open architected system where you take atoms and combine them, you shift one molecule over another, change the bonds from one place to another, and it changes its chirality, and it causes harm or it causes good. That universality in itself is sufficient for you and I to submit to ourselves that, wow, it's not so enclosed, it's so universal that we share so much together that it all works in consonance that an, an incredible creator had to put this together for all of it to work together. That in itself is sufficient evidence for anyone. We don't have to get into polemics into rhetoric, into discussions, it is sufficient to see yourself in the mirror and say, wow. To reject that is tantamount to saying, I don't want to see it, and that's fine. It's, it's free choice. So what I'm getting completely from this debate, when it comes to morality, make it yourself. Even you yourself wrote in, on your, on your, uh, in your uh, website, you say, 
Everybody's a free thinker. No one tells you anything. Not a rabbi, not a priest, not a politician. But you didn't add one thing. Not an atheist either. You didn't put that in there. Because you're saying to yourselves that we should have our own thought and I'm telling you how it should be. Well, then you should. You've negated your own purpose. Because when you say you shouldn't impose any law to anybody, then you should not even speak about it. You should be silent and let every man think for himself. But that's not the case. You say the Bible is not... You say that the Bible... Correction. The Bible is not our source. The Quran is our source. The original Bible, which was revealed to Jesus, was a perfect book. It was adulterated. We do not accept it. We accept it as a revelation to Jesus. Jesus was a great prophet. He was a great man. And he, could, he performed many miracles. The Quran upholds it. And we have no doubt in it, no questions. In conclusion, we say the Quran is our litmus test. It is the criterion. It is what decides right from wrong. Science is subject to it. The higher authority, the one who created the universe, has put science into motion. And to take one aspect of the greater and to say, that is my God, is a very foolish statement. You say, I don't care about people praying. Yet I see so much anger in your statement. You say, I don't care if a person wants to do this or he wants to do that. Yet you've made so many condescending statements that you're praying to this vicious God or you're, f you're fooling around. And people even say they make funny statements about people bowing their heads on the ground. When I read that, it's a clear indication that you're angry. You're angry with something. Rather than have respect for somebody who wants to worship his own God, why don't you say, let him worship? Yet on your website you say, we should, we should forbid religion, I mean, worship of God in, in school. It's a, it's a public uh, place. It, it's our tax dollars. Well, now you are promoting uh, a rejection of prayer in public. See, there you go. You see the actions coming when it comes to the practical indications. When it comes to the individual, in conclusion, the individual knows his Lord. A man comes to our 60, our 60 Imam Jafar Sadiq and says, he says, tell me about this existence of God. He says, what do you do for a living? He says, I am, I'm a sailor. He says, when I travel, I, I, he says, have you had those moments where you've been floating on that, on that piece of wood in your life? He says, yes. Did you have that glimmer of hope? He said, yes. He says, that's your Lord. That's inbuilt into you. I give you an example. My uncle was flying on the, in Air Tanzania and the plane was primarily of Chinese people who were atheists. And the, the pilot says that the gear is not going to land. You know, it's not opening up. So we're going to do a belly landing. And he says, all these Chinese were murmuring something. Anyway, the, the, the gears opened up and it landed properly. So my uncle asked him, he says, what were you murmuring? You're atheist. He says, yes, we're atheists. And what were you murmuring? He says, we were, we were murmuring about that, that hope. That's so my uncle said to them, but you don't believe in it. He said, then we did. <laughs> and in conclusion, in conclusion, when you look at the atheistic perspective, when you look at the atheist perspective, you find that there is no time factor. And in final thing, as you say, he said, let's worship God, uh, uh, for the sake of goodness. Let's worship God for the sake of God. Thank you. Sure, just one second. On behalf of the Tawheed Institute of New York, I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time today to come and sit through the debate. We apologize if it started a little bit late. I myself apologize if I said anything wrong or to offend anybody. Please forgive me. And especially, we'd like to thank both of our speakers for taking the time for preparing their arguments. Let's give them a